Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. You got a nice target. That's a good long-term. Both of those are good long-term weaknesses, some isolated pawns, so that's a good trade. This is okay. Um, I like to, if I can, I like to let my opponent trade into me because then I'm going to get my rook onto the file for free, basically. Whereas in this case, white ended up getting the rook onto the open file for free. Now, you can still fight back later, but it just kind of takes you a little bit more time. So as a general rule, I try not to trade like that and, and allow my opponent to trade into me unless there's a very specific reason, you know, why you need to trade for some tactic or something. Otherwise, I think I would probably just develop right away here. Move your bishop somewhere and just leave that because, you know, if white takes you, you're, you're happy to take back with your rook. Yeah, this is pretty good. Uh, I think... So, doubled rooks are, like, very strong if you can get them. So, I would be, if I'm playing this, I'm going to, like, try to do that. Now, I can't because the bishop is here. So, I'm going to think of ways to get rid of that bishop. F6 comes to mind immediately, but, of course, it's pinned. So, we can't do that. So, I think what I would probably play is something like H6. Because that's going to force the bishop away and then allow me to double up. And now I have some threats on this bishop and rook, right? Because I'm, I'm threatening to play C6 now with my double rooks creating an attack on the rook here. So that's what I would be thinking through, I think. That being said, rook e8 is not a bad move because it's also an open file, but there's just something really good about the doubled rooks on the same file. You, you get a lot of tactical threats a lot of times when you do, you do that. Rook b1. Uh, yeah, rook b1 is okay. I will just tell you, Usually I, I pause when I'm going to be moving a rook to defend a pawn like that only because usually there are better uses for your rooks like than sitting behind a pawn. So like in this position, I'm going to probably play knight a4 and try to go knight b6 because this is a nice hole. There's no pawns, right? They can attack my knight. And once I get my knight on b6, I'm shutting down the queen. I'm shutting down the rook. And my knight's like a monster. It's like attacking all these squares. It's like attacking things. And the only way black can really deal with that is if they want to give up their rook. Or maybe go here and trade for it. But then I'm going to get this passed pawn protected by my bishop. And that's going to be that's going to be awesome, right? So, so yeah. I mean, this is a really great idea for white. Like, this is a fantastic idea. Whenever you see a hole like this, you want to be thinking, can I get my knight there, right? So, like, I'm also thinking about this and this. The problem is those holes are a little bit more difficult to, to get a knight to because the way the pawns are controlling the squares, right? If you you could get a knight here, maybe h3, knight h2, but that's you know gonna take a lot of time. This one's very simple. Two moves and, and you're done. Completely shuts down this file. So that's what I'm looking at. Um not that rook b1 is bad, but you know, just keep those things in mind. So So here's what I'm thinking. By doing this trade right here, you kind of help out Black's Bishop, right? Like now Black's Bishop has some life, some things to do, some places to go. It has some hopes and dreams that weren't there before. So I think if I'm playing this game, I'm going to just leave that. And I'm going to make sure that Black can't play this unless I'm getting a free pawn out of the deal. So I'm going to play like Rook E1. And actually, let's see, when did you play Rook yeah, it's, it's hard to know that this is going to happen at this moment in the game. That would be sort of like proactive kind of planning ahead if black tries to break out rookie E1. But even here, a move later, I think it would be fine. Just go back. Something has changed, and now this is where you want your rook because it stops E5, right? What's black going to do? Give you a free pawn? Probably not. And if they don't, what's this bishop going to do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you've got pressure on this pawn. So next move, I'm going to bring this rook up. I don't know what Black's going to do. I'm going to bring this rook up. Uh, I'm going to bring this rook over here, right? And look at this. Black's all tied up in knots. Everybody is just defending. This is the kind of position that you want. And then you can just slowly improve your position. And you can take your time because what's Black going to do? Like Black has like no moves. So all you have to do is like bring your king up. Now you can start pushing these pawns. Maybe you can reposition your king over here if you want. You can even like run on this side of the board. You can do whatever you want because Black's just totally jammed up, right? So... That's what I recommend. This way that bishop... Okay. Either the bishop was going to move somewhere or now you traded it, which 
this knight is still really strong. I don't know that I would have traded it for, the, for that bishop. Although the bishop, like I said, is going to come out here. So best thing to do would have not been to let it out. Let's talk about this because this is something that a lot of people like to do. And you have to understand the risks associated with this. So a lot of the time you're going to castle kingside, right? And that's kind of where your king's going to be safe. You develop the rest of your pieces, you castle kingside, the game goes on. When you play G4, you have to realize that, okay, if I'm going to castle kingside now, what does that mean? Well, it means my king is going to be more exposed. So you either have to be okay with that or you have to plan on castling the other way or, or maybe not castling at all. So I'm not saying this is bad. You should never do it. I'm just saying make sure you understand when you play a move like G4, it's a very committal move because pawns never go backwards. You can never be like, you know what? I'm just going to move it back and, and you know, castle over here later. No, no, no. That's it, right? The, there's some weaknesses here, particularly on these squares, right, that are going to be there the rest of the game. Now, it's not all bad news. Like I said, you gain some space. You push black away. You get rid of the, the pin uh, that was here, right, so you can move your knight. So it's totally fine. I do that sometimes too. Um, just keep in mind, like, th that's a risk, you know, and you have to basically plan for that. Also, I really like to do it if I know that my opponent's king is already there, because then you can like get some pawns going and attack the king. Right now, you don't really know what black's going to They might castle this way. They might not castle. All right, but anyway, it's not, it's not bad. I just wanted to mention that. All right, I don't like this move. I don't know what you were thinking, um, but here's the thing. Notice this e4 square, right? It's one of the central squares and black's eyeing it, right? And so when you go here, you completely give up control of that square. So black has all sorts of options now. And I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't really like that idea. I think you need to finish developing. So this bishop's got to come out, whether you're going to go to d3 or g2 or b5, you got to develop that bishop. And then you got to move your queen probably up so that you can have options to castle, right? And a lot of times in the London, you, you temporarily give up control of e4, but at some point you do want to try to play e4 and break in the center. And so bishop d3, queen e2, maybe getting ready to do that at some point makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, this, not a big fan of that move. All right, so. Hmm. Yeah, see, the problem is you're, you're trying to attack over here, which is good. That's where the king is. But your king's not really safe. And there's some undefended pieces, right? So usually when you see strong players attacking and pushing pawns, it's only after they've sort of fixed all the other problems, right? They've, they've gotten their pieces developed. They don't really have any major weaknesses or things undefended. Once you fix that, that's when you go for the attacks, right? So you just want to get your ordering correct there. Here we go. Wow. Wow, G5. Okay. Um, for those of you who are under 1400, what's the, what's the big, big drawback for black for playing this move? Light squares are weak. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right here. It's it's this diagonal and then these light squares. Exactly right. Specifically this diagonal. This is, by the way, this is the fool's mate, right? When, when white plays f3 and g4 and gets mated in two moves, it's just like this because you open up that diagonal to the queen. So you don't even have to save your bishop here. You could play a move like e4. Let black take it, and you're still going to be in a winning position after queen h5. That's how good this is. You can even give up a piece, and I can tell you, here, we'll just check it. We'll turn it on Stockfish here. I guarantee you Stockfish is going to say white's better in that position. So let's just see. If I play the move e4, oh, that's the best move. That's what Stockfish's best move is. So ignore this, because once you get this, it's over for black. It's over, right? Um, I mean, yeah, queen takes d5 check. What does it say the best move is here? Let's just see. Back to h5. So you take the pawn, probably just bringing out a piece. Yeah, just castling, and white's totally winning. Even though you lost the bishop, it doesn't even matter because black's king. So, correct. So, you know, next time this happens, you'll know. Keep an eye out for that. And you want to be looking at moves like e3 and e4 
Why? Because you want to get your queen over there. So if you can get your queen there, and by the way, if you can ever put your opponent's king in check and they can't easily block it and they have to move their king and it's pretty early in the game, like 99 times out of 100, you should do it. Because as soon as you make them move their king like that, they lose castling rights, probably puts their king on an awkward square, and it's just going to be really good for you. Now, if this pawn was back here on g7, it's different because then they can just block right? And now you can go there with your queen, but they're just going to block you and you, you kind of waste a move. The fact that there's no easy way to stop that check is why I, I want to go there, okay? So it's very different than if they have an easy way to block it. All right, so of course, developing pieces is great. You can't go wrong there. You know, um, I'm just letting you know that that was really the, the weakness in Black's position. That's how you take advantage of it. Okay. Yeah, be careful castling when there's like advanced pawns in front of your king just because when you get to the higher levels if you do that they're going to be pushing these pawns and attacking your king and, and you're going to have to deal with that whereas maybe in this game you play queen e2 and you castle this way right because it looks much safer over here than in front of all these pawns but anyway okay so you went here uh what about this square right this is a, an amazing outpost and remember, when your opponent moves pawns forward, they create weaknesses. And by pushing this pawn to here, this square immediately jumps out in my mind as, oh, I, I got to take advantage of that, right? Because why is that? Let's say black played a different move, like rook over here. Or, well, maybe that's not the best. But let's say they played rook here. If I play knight here now, black's going to play b6. And guess what? I got to move. And I, I just wasted a move. Can't do anything, right? Because there's a pawn that can control that square. So as soon as I see b5, I'm like, okay, there's no more pawns. And that's important, right? Because knights are three points. The only piece that I'm really scared of with my knight is a pawn. Because that's the only piece that's lower than my than my knight, right? If a knight attacks my knight, it's just a trade. If a queen attacks my knight, I don't care. It's a queen, right? If a rook attacks my, I don't care. It's the pawns that are, that are going to chase my knight around. So that's why c5 now becomes a really nice square for our knight, okay? So knight to c5 would have been a great move. And notice too, like, look at the effectiveness of the knight. Boom, 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 boom. You're attacking two weak pawns already. You're taking away some squares in black's camp. You're blocking off this file so that the, the queen can't come through. As opposed to back here, the, the only things that you're attacking are already well defended, right? And you can't really go anywhere else and, and you're not blocking the queen the queen can now infiltrate if it wants so you just see how like one small move can make a huge difference so hmm yeah this is a tough position this is a tough position because your knight is trapped you want to defend it i get that the problem is this is a very very weakening move on your king side very very weakening so the the big takeaway is going back here Try not to put your knights on the edge of the board. A knight on the rim is grim or dim, depending on which version you've heard. So probably you need to move here or you need to move back here and then maybe relocate it over here to this outpost. That's what this knight should be doing. H4, unless you have a place to go next, probably don't want to go to the side, right? And you don't have a place to go. Those are taken away by the pawns. So these, this is where you want to go. Okay, and, and, and then you would avoid the situation, right? Now you, you kind of have a problem here. Okay, uh, this is fine because you're taking a pawn. But remember, if you are ahead, a lot of material and, and a rook is a lot, right? anything above five points is a lot. You, you Probably the easiest way to win the game is to trade because the, as you simplify this down, like let's just say you can trade off all these, let's say this rook is going to be just go have a party and just eat all the pawns and black's not going to be able to really stop you. The more pieces that are on the board, the more black can try to do things. So in this case, I'm just going to trade. And yeah, it, the game becomes really easy if you do that. Bishop d2. Yeah, bishop d2 is okay. Um, I I like to play moves like queen b3 a lot of times in these positions. Queen b3 is a very tricky move. Uh, it creates a lot of threats. So you've got a threat on the b7 pawn. You've got a threat on the bishop. You've got a threat on d5. It's lined up with the king. 
It also just, you know, defends your knight if you need that, gets it out of the way so that your rooks can be connected. And so I think I would probably play queen b3 here. Uh, that's just me. Bishop d2, nothing wrong with bishop d2. It's just a little bit passive, you know, kind of defensive move. Um, and I like to be a little bit more aggressive when I can. That's more of a personal style than this is the best move in the position, right? Um, but it, it does make it difficult on your opponent because now they have to be really careful um, that something, you know, a tactic doesn't open up at some point, right? So, yeah, so this is a tough position. This is a tough position because now you got you got to really decide, is it better to defend and then try to bring my king around somehow? Or is it better to push this and, and allow black? Here's the thing that I would be thinking about. One one lone pawn, a lot of times in a rook ending like this, it's going to be difficult to make progress. Because what's going to happen is at some point you're going to push it and you're going to push it. It's going to get to like, let's say here. Black's going to put the rook behind it, right? So let, let's actually just, for example, let's see what happened in the game for one second. Okay, this is what happened in the game. So perfect. Black's going to put the rook behind it. And what are you going to do now? How, how are you going to make progress? It's not that easy, right? Unless your king is close over here or there's more pieces on the board. But in just a rook and pawn endgame like this, it's very difficult for you to make progress, okay? Black, on the other hand, has two pawns that are connected. Very easy to push two pawns because they, they just help each other, right? Like you go here and this guy helps him or the other way he helps him and they just keep helping each other. Much, much easier. And so I, I don't think... If it's me in this position, I don't think I'm going to let black do that. Um, I think I'm probably going to have to play either rook a4 to, to defend that, or maybe rook here to at least get one pawn, right? Something like this. Because I don't I don't want to give my opponent two connected pawns. One pawn, I can very easily deal with it, and I'll be fine. Two pawns, that's a different story. Hmm. So you go there. Yeah. Let's see what's happening. So what you have to remember, what you have to remember is if in a, in a game like this where there's multiple pawns on one side of the board, if somebody's king ends up stuck on, on one side and the other person's king is closer to the pawns, whoever's king is closer is going to win every time. They're just going to take all the pawns and you're, you're not going to be able to do anything. Kings are very good at like hunting down pawns, by the way, right? The way they move, they just control all the squares. So you can just take all the pawns that are around. So, you know, right here, right here, actually, you need to really be thinking, okay, if I do this trade, can I come back over, right? And if not, you don't, you don't want to do that. You got you got to come up with something else. You got to come up with another plan. So, um, yeah. That's it's a tough way to lose because it should have been a draw, but as soon as you make this trade, everything changes, right? And now it's all it's it's black, so you're gonna eat up all your pawns. Yep. And there's just nothing to do at this point. So I'm just looking at Stockfish says there's some some crazy idea here. I don't know what it is, so I wanna just see. What's the idea here? A takes B4, C takes B4. What, what's, what is this? Oh, Queen D4 check. Nice little tactic. I didn't even see that at first glance. I just noticed that Stockfish was going crazy. So that's, wow. Yeah, that's a good example of like, you, you want to be kind of like always scanning the board, right? Like, okay, here's a king. Here's an open diagonal. Here's an undefended piece, right? Like if you scan the board and there's like, here's the question for you scan the board what's the undefended pieces that white has well that's defended that's defended everything's defended except that rook so now i'm like okay huh i wonder if i can attack the rook and if you know maybe you can kind of put all this together and open diagonal on the king an undefended rook my queen has access to this right and then oh a couple of simple captures and guess what all of a sudden you just won yourself a rook so that's like how, you know, stronger players find these advanced tactics. They just sort of break it down piece by piece, right? And then you say, oh, take, take, check, there's a rook. It's not that easy. I mean, I missed it myself, right? But I didn't like spend a lot of time analyzing. But um, basically, like as soon as you see this move, it's like, okay, now the diagonal's open. Can I do something about that? Hmm. And maybe you, maybe you find that idea, right? 
takes this, takes this, queen d4. Black wins. Attacking some weak stuff. Okay. It's a risky move, but I guess it's okay. I say it's risky because you can't move your knight now. And so if, if white can attack it again, like queen f2, what are you going to do? I, I don't, I guess you can try to defend with your rook, maybe. Risky move. And also, like, let, let's just take this for an example. Let's say you can play here. I don't even know if this works. My, what I'm concerned about is that after this trade happens, you're still stuck in this pin and you still can't move. And notice how you can't move your queen either because now you lose the piece. Well, it's, it's white's turn, but let's just say here, you can't do this or you lose this piece. So, you know, putting yourself into a pin like that, you, you gotta be really careful. You just gotta be really careful. Generally speaking, a lot of the times, if you do that, your opponent's gonna have some kind of a tactic available. So just keep that in the back of your mind. In this case, they just traded for you, which is very nice. Very nice of your opponent to do that, but okay. G4, it's a committal move, you know. I don't know that I would play this personally if I'm castled here. I think it's a little bit too much, especially because, because black hasn't castled yet. They can very easily play H5 and open up my king. Now, yes, you can force a queen trade the next move. And so maybe that's, sorry, maybe that's what you were thinking. Which is okay. Um, but yeah, personally, I don't really, really like that. Actually, I think you can just win a pawn now that I'm looking at it. Trade the queens and just take on here, I think makes more sense. I don't think you need to play g4 and open up your king like that. Looks good. Developing, great. Okay. So this is a good this is a good learning opportunity. So the bishop's obviously under attack, right? You have to do something about that. You can do what you played in the game, b3, right? Defend it. You can go bishop to b3. Or you can do something like queen e2 or maybe queen d3, probably queen e2, let's just say. So you got three options. One, two, and three. Uh, which one is the best? Let's ask chat. Let's ask the chat. Which which one is the best? Bishop b3, b3, or queen e2? And wh what's the idea? Wh why would we defend this bishop one way or the other? Three, three moves. Free pawn. Yeah, Peter, you're right. There, there's a pawn over there. But let, let's just pretend that that wasn't there because you're right. There is a free pawn. That's another move. But let's just say we're worried about the bishop. We're trying to defend the bishop. Personally... I like the move queen e2. Why, why do I like queen e2? Because not only am I defending, I'm doing something else that I probably was going to do anyway, right? I'm not going to leave my queen sitting on d d1 forever. I'm going to want to get it into the game. Queen e2, I'm creating a nice battery that I can use to go and attack my opponent's king. I'm also giving myself the option if I'd like to castle queenside, I can, which is nice because it immediately puts my rook on a half open file. That's pretty good. I'm adding some support to my e pawn. I'm adding some support to my f2 pawn, which by the way is attacked. And I deal with the threat. So I accomplish like, what What did I say? One thing, getting ready to castle, two, three, four. It's like five things with one move, as opposed to one thing with one move. You did one thing, you defended your bishop, that's good. But do you wanna do one thing or do you wanna do five things? Also, b3 creates some weaknesses that that you're never going to be able to recover from in this game, right? The, these squares are permanently weak for the rest of the game because your pawn is no longer supporting that knight. B3 is great because because first of all you're noticing the big threat, so that's a good a good you know step. But when you want to take it to the next level, you want to start pairing that with okay, I'd like to defend my bishop. I'd also like to do some other stuff. Let's do it at the same time. And by the way, like this is something that I think a lot of players don't think about, but when you give yourself the option to castle both directions, number one, it's it's difficult for your opponent to like know where your king is going to be, which is which is really nice, right? Because they can't sort of set up an attack, right? If I'm going to just castle right away, my opponent, if they want, 
can start throwing their pawns at me or, or maneuvering their pieces and, and attack me when I'm kind of like waiting and I'm like, okay, Michael this way, Michael this way, they don't know. But also as the game goes on, you can use your own judgment and be like, okay, I think it makes the most sense for me to castle this way because I want my rook here and I want my king's going to be safe. Over, or I think it makes the most sense to castle over here because I'm going to, I'm going to get ready and push these pawns forward. So giving yourself more options is, is always a good idea. Trading off that extra pawn, that's fine. E5. So, hmm. Here's here's why I don't like E5. When I see E5, I get a little bit scared because there's a rook lined up with my queen. So, that's why I don't want to play E5. I don't want to let that happen to my queen, right? So, I'm going to, again, probably play queen E2 to get that out of the line of the rook. Or maybe... um. I mean, it almost looks like you, you could start attacking at this point because you're developed, you're castled. So now you could maybe start thinking about weaknesses in your opponent's position. So maybe knight d5, knight b5 to attack here. Bishop takes f7 almost works, but remember our knight is now undefended, right? Because we moved this pawn up. So we can see why that was important to leave it there because now we have an undefended piece we have to kind of watch out for. So... A lot of moves that you might consider. I just don't like this one just because of where my queen is at, right? You got to be, be careful with that. Ah, and yep, see, there you go, right? We lost the queen. So g3. You went there, okay. Wait, what if you just, is this just mate and two? Checkmate? Yeah, it's, it, it is mate and two. You take this and then it's over. So... This is like a something you would find in a tactics puzzle book, right? If you do lots of mate and twos, there, there's actually some books that are specifically mate and twos, or they have they have categories like mate and one sections, mate and two, mate and three, mate and four. Can't remember the name of the book. There's a, there's like a famous one. I'll have to look it up. But specifically, checkmates in one, two, three are really good to practice because some of the like let's just say chess.com puzzles. They're not always mates. Sometimes it's, you know, you have a random fork and win a piece or you just defend something or whatever. It could be anything. It's good to practice the checkmates for these situations and you'll probably see this, right? So just, just work on those if you can. Um, because yeah, this is a nice, this is a nice one, right? White has to take you back and it doesn't matter. You, you just have checkmate. Next move. Yeah, I've had games like this too. It's like amazing. And somehow the king just ends up like, escaping to the other side of the board and you're like how did that happen i can see that's probably what's happening here yep yep and then you have no pieces left and it's like how did that happen yeah that's tough you did a good job attacking uh one thing i'll say if you're going to play openings like like you did and you're going to attack tactics especially the checkmate ones are going to help you more than anything because you're going to get lots of positions like this as, as long as you play like you did which was great uh, just work on those tactics. Get a, get one of those books, Mate and Twos. It's full of Mate and Twos and just work on them. The one that I recommend a lot. This is super old, but it's a thousand and one brilliant ways to checkmate. This one doesn't tell you how many moves it is like some of the other ones do, but they're all checkmates and it breaks them into categories. So like, see if I can show you. So chapter one is queen sacrifices. And so you get practice, you know, sacrificing your queen to get checkmate. And then you've got, uh, let's see, what's the other sections? I think there's one like checkmate without the queen. So you see mating patterns where there's no queen involved. And that's that's helpful because you want it, your, your mind to be able to recognize other combinations of pieces. Carrying the king, chapter four, I don't know what that it's all about um let's see what's this one discovered check and double check is chapter five so you get practice with checkmates that come about from a discovered check and a double check and so something like this i don't know maybe you already have that maybe you're already working on it but that's what i would recommend bishop d3 usually is is unadvisable because you're making this bishop stuck how are you going to get this bishop out you can't move your deep on you can't move this bishop out Yes, you can fee and keto it, but that's pretty weird, and usually that's not the best way. It, it's nice to have the option to play d4. So bishop b3 is a weird move. Queen g5, you definitely are 
immediately attacking the, the weakness. So I got to give it to you for that. Now, you have to be careful because, yeah, exactly like this, it becomes a question of, is it worth it? Like, is it worth, is the pawn worth the trouble that you're going to go through to get it? I personally would say, no, I don't like playing positions like this where I have to spend a bunch of time to go get one pawn. And then at the end of it all, my opponent's going to have like three pieces that are just attacking me, right? So for example, rook g1, yep. And look at this position. White has this and this and this and this ready to go. And I'm just like, I got my pawn, you know, it's something. I got one pawn, cool. So I don't like to do that, right? And so if it's me going way back here, I'm going to be like, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. Just because of that reason, I know what's going to happen. I know, I know how it's going to end, right? So keep that in mind. Now, there are different situations, okay, where maybe I already have like all my pieces out. And I see an opportunity to go for a pawn. Okay, then yeah, I'll go for it. I'm already developed and I feel comfortable with my position. But right now, I mean, this is move two, right? We, we're in the development phase. So I don't agree with, with that uh, decision for that reason. Rook b1. I, I want to see this bishop getting developed. Uh, I'm seeing a, a lot of other moves and we haven't finished development yet. And maybe that's because you were, didn't know where to put it. Uh, so... You can go to e3, and if they take you, you can actually just take with the pawn. And, and even before you move your rook is probably a better time to do that. So like back here, you can go bishop e3. And the point is, yes, yes you get some doubled pawns, but now you have a half-open f-file, okay, which you can use. You can move this knight and do something here. And you get this pawn on e3, which... It can be weak at times, but it's also sort of helping you in the center, right? Like knight, the knight can't go there. And now you can play d4 whenever you want. And, you, you know, if black takes, you're going to just take it back. So this is actually a nice way to go. And, of course, if black, like, tries to attack it right away, you can just defend it with your queen, something like this. And, you, you know, you'll be fine. So this is just, especially if you play this opening, right, the Italian game like this, you're going to see this move a lot. And so just remember, bishop b3 is totally fine to play. And just capture with your pawn, put your queen up, and, you know, try to use this to your advantage, right? You've got some things lined up, and uh, black has to be careful, right? So, so right, right around here, you know, let's see, Stockfish says minus 4, minus 5, minus 4.5. You're totally winning. You're totally winning. Your bishops are awesome. Uh, sorry, your bishops are awesome. Wow, can't draw diagonals. Your bishops are awesome. You're up some material. Your rooks are doing great. White's pieces are awkward. But you do want to ask yourself the question, how could I lose this game? Like, I'm winning. I'm doing well. How could I possibly lose? Well, as soon as you start seeing, like, a clump of pieces over by your king, you should start getting this, like, danger sense. Like, so something needs to go off in your head. Like, okay, let's be a little bit careful here. My queen's way over here. My bishops are kind of not around my king my rooks are kind of not around my king and now there are three pieces that's a lot now the queen maybe in one move is also going to be involved so i i'm like starting to get a little bit concerned i want to make sure i'm looking for tactics i'm looking for what what happens if any of these pieces move towards my king right and so maybe you consider these moves right because there's a rook here and so I think it's just a simple move like king f8 would be fine. Just getting out of that pin. See that pin on the pawn? Uh, that's a big deal. Okay. And so keep keep that in mind because that, that's really what happened. You were totally focused on being aggressive, which is not bad. But, you know, eventually you got to at least look at what's going on with your own king. And that's what happened. White was able to take advantage uh, of that. And, yeah, now you're, you're just losing now.